Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for May 20th, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dalpide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Deployable Internet Routing Security with Amir Herzberg. Amir is a professor for cybersecurity innovation in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Connecticut. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, the presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. So many of you have already found the chat box. Uh, if you hover your pointer in the Zoom application, you can click on chat and that will open the chat window. And uh, we, can, we will have time at the end of the presentation to do questions as well. And with that, I will hand it over to Amir. Amir, welcome. Hi, thank you, Jeanette. Okay, so welcome everybody and let's begin. So our topic, of course, is uh, deployable internet routing sec security. I'll give a bit of background. I hope I will not be wasting anybody's time, but I'll give a bit of background in case some of you are not completely familiar with internet routing and its security, but very briefly. So I hope it will be <laughs> enough and not waste time. And then I will discuss the main solution that is uh, currently uh, uh, developed, which is in the ITF, which is a standard called RPKI, and in particular a component called ROV. I'll discuss this uh, quickly. And then I'll discuss the deployment challenges. So you, why we should, it's not trivial, okay, so there is a standard, let's just deploy it. It's a, there are some challenges. And uh, our efforts to improve RPKI, including its deployment, uh, which are several projects we are working on in, in my group here. And uh, then I'll talk about some, uh, if we have time, hopefully we'll also discuss briefly the related topic of related to internet routing security, which is denial of service attacks. I'll give a specific example of DNS amplification denial of service attack, discuss another routing security mechanism called URPF, which is a very well-known traditional routing mechanism, how it may be able to help, and um, hopefully discuss briefly our efforts to improve and deploy uh, URPF, which are also related to RPKI, and then a summary. Okay, let's go. Uh, so our focus, when we talk about the internet routing, internet routing is actually separated to routing within uh, domains, which we actually call autonomous systems, like a, a, a referred to as ASS, or autonomous systems, and uh, which could be internet service providers or a university campus and so on, a company. And we have routing within an AS, within an, a domain, and we have routing between different ASs. Both of these have security concerns, but we will focus on the inter-AS, inter-domain aspect of it. Uh, today, which is the more critical, uh, because we have different entities with different interests, and some of these entities may actually be intentionally trying to attack each other. That's very common on the internet, obviously. So, unfortunately, internet AS routing is well known to be vulnerable to many attacks. And the two main attacks are misrouting, which are essentially sending packets, uh, excuse me, intercepting packets, although you're not the correct destination, so causing packets to be received by an incorrect destination. So either you, you actually intercept them, you are the attacker, you hijack the information, or you black hole the information, so you don't get the information, uh, preventing a kind of a denial of service attack where the information is just lost, or you actually do the reverse, you direct the information into some internet links to congest them into a victim, so that's another way of doing denial of service based on, on routing. And notice that even a very short-lived missed routing attack of a minute or two can be very significant, in particular for it may allow us to do stuff like DNS poisoning, which then is a very long-lived attack. So even short-lived uh, routing attacks could be very significant. The other sort of routing problems are incorrect source, not destination, where we are simply sending packets with an incorrect sender ID, pretending to be somebody else. And the most common 
goal for this is clogging, amplification-based denial of service attacks. And there is another goal of doing some attacks on protocols where by sending the incorrect destination, we can actually spoof as somebody else. In particular, this is a main tool for DNS poisoning. Both of these are very common problems, very common vulnerabilities exploited on a daily basis. Attacks are happening all the time for denial of service, for spam, phishing, many other abuses. So there have been many, this is a lot of awareness of these problems. There have been many attempts to fix from the 90s, uh, a lot, a lot of efforts. And indeed, there are some standards trying to defend against these attacks. The most notable standards are probably RPKI and DGPSEC. Unfortunately, both of these are almost not deployed at all. And they were, I will not discuss BGPSEC, but I'm actually, and I think many people are, are very pessimistic about BGPSEC ever being deployed, but we will not have time to cover that today. And also it's a pessimistic kind of message. So we are focusing on what we think could actually work. And, and these are, and RPKI definitely falls under this. Our research goal is to have deployable effective defenses. So it's even something which is only deployable but not effective is not enough, but also if it's something which is effective but not deployable, BGPSEC, if it would have been completely deployed, it would have been quite effective, but in my, my opinion, is not deployable. So we want deployable effective defenses. Uh, first, uh, let's see a simple example of a misrouting attack. So you see the green lines, uh, the green arrows, represent the normal routing from Guadalajara, Mexico, to Washington, D.C., which is a pretty straight line, you know, how you would expect. And then someday, suddenly, people at the Renesis, one of the internet routing companies, noticed that the routing is going in a very weird way. As you can see, instead of going directly from Guadalajara to the States, to Washington, it goes through Europe, London, Moscow, Minsk, Frankfurt, and only then somehow returning to Washington, D.C. That appears very suspect. So essentially, we suspect that this was done intentionally by some agent, some place around this route, which have been hijacking this traffic. Now, why would the attacker do this? There could be many goals for the attacker to do such an attack. The first and most obvious is to eavesdrop on the traffic, you know, just to see what's the traffic. And uh, there are many motivations to do that, of course. But there are other motivations. In particular, we are not just eavesdropping. We could actually do an active man in the middle attack. We could change the traffic. We can do DNS poisoning and other kind of active attacks. We could use it for spam and phishing, which actually means we may not even need to capture an address which is used, but we can just capture addresses which nobody even uses, and yet we, can, we get value for spam and phishing by not being blackmailed, a, bl a blacklisted, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, we could distribute malware, we can do, uh, do a denial of service attack, and we can do traffic analysis. So even if the information is encrypted, we can still know who is sending to whom and how much and when which could be very valuable in many scenarios. So this is a real life example. And there are as I said, many defenses over the years, but the challenge is deployable yet effective defenses. Okay, so to understand how these attacks happen, we have to learn a bit routing very quickly, of course, <laughs> interdomain routing. So the interdomain routing is done by a protocol called BGP for Border Gateway Protocol. And the basic mechanism of this protocol is actually pretty simple, it sends announcement. So every domain sends to its adjacent domains announcement saying essentially, and here you can see one simplified announcement. If you want to reach this prefix 180.10.0.0.16, then you need to, you can uh, go through this route, through me, AS200, you see this, prefix I'm showing here, this announcement is sent by AS200, and then to AS100, which is the first AS, so it's the origin. And you see that actually AS200 received the same similar announcement from AS100 saying the same prefix and saying the pass is only me, so essentially saying I am the origin of this pass, the prefix is here with me, as you can see. So then AS200 sends to AS300, and AS300 may have received it also directly from AS100, is 300 selects one of them and sends forward to is 400, which may send also to is 500 or somebody else. 
and so on. We see the announcements are, the path in the announcement is getting longer and longer as multiple ASs are forwarding them. And one may, if you know some other routing algorithms, you may ask, why do we actually send this entire path in the messages? Uh, couldn't we just send the length of the path to select? So the basic answer is, in BGP, the decision is a policy-based decision. So we can make a decision on whether, which is related to the identities of the ASS along the past. But in addition to this, there is a basic reason for which BGP uses the identities of the ASS along the past, which is to avoid loops. So if AS300, let's say, receive an, uh, an announcement where AS300 is already some place on the path, it knows, oh, this is a loop, somebody got it by mistake, I'm just going to ignore it. So that's a basic reason. But the other reason, as I mentioned, is the policy. For every announcement you receive, actually for every prefix you receive, uh, announcements for this prefix, for example, this prefix 180.10.0.0, we need to decide what announcement, we received multiple announcements. For example, here 300 received the yellow one from 200 and the green one from 100. Which of them should we use? And so if we want to send packets, should we send through 200 or directly to 100? And uh, what announcements should we send? Should I send to 400 the announcement? Uh, which of them should I send? And, and to which of my neighbors? Notice here, for example, 400 is not sending to 500 the announcement. Why? Because of a policy, okay? Now, how this, the main criteria for these policies is relationship, the relationship between ASs. There could be many other criteria, but the basic one are relationship. And usually I uh, denote this relationship in relationships in actually two ways. One is errors. So we have a provider, a yes or domain like 200 and the customer is 300. So this means the 300 is paying for 200 to provide internet services. As you can see, it's already also paying to 100. So the error will go from the provider to the customer and also the providers, I put them on top, higher than the customer. So you see now 300 is a provider for 400. What happens between 400 and 500? We don't see any error and they are on the same level. Also between 200 and 100, we don't see any error and they're the same level. These we call them peers. They don't pay each other. So they are just cooperating to have better communication, to have more connectivity, but don't pay each other. And in this case, notice that 400 decided not to send this announcement to 500. Why? It actually makes sense. Because the announcement is, he gets from 300, which is a provider. So he's paying for the traffic to 300. And and uh, he's paying for the traffic to 300 and 500 is a peer he's not paying me for traffic so why should i tell 500 you can reach for me this prefix and i will be ending up paying to my provider 300 for this traffic so he's not telling 500 because not paying 500 is not paying for this traffic he's a peer okay which is the basic of the typical policy uh, or used in BGP or, or atypical policy. And most BGP policies have this kind of property which you call value free, which means that you always prefer, you prefer announcements which will give you better revenue. So if you have an announcement which you, which you received from a customer and the one from a peer, you will prefer to announce the one from the customer. If you, and to use the one from the customer. If you have one from a peer and one from a provider, you'll prefer to use the one from the peer. And if you have two announcements which are from the same relationship, like here we have from 200 and from 100, both of them are providers of 300. So we end up paying both of them, right? So which of them should we use? Usually people use the shorter one, the one with less ASs, because assuming that is somehow related also to the efficiency of the route. More, more domains, probably longer connection, uh, slower, right? So that's what we usually prefer. So that's why 300 here prefer the, the shorter pass through directly to 100 and not the pass from here from 200 and only then 100. And 
should I announce it? So we announce it only if it is to, going to a customer or if we received it from a customer. That is, we only announce stuff where we are making some profit out of. If you receive something from a peer, we are not going to send it to another peer and just have these two peers transfer the communication through us. We paying for, you know, the resources and the computing resources involved in this and nobody pays us. Okay. Now, this was a very, very brief and, of course, imprecise background on BGP. And now let's talk about some background on, on BGP attacks, on attacks on PGP. And the most common attack on BGP is called prefix hijacking, where you see here an example where we have just three ASs for simplicity. And the, we have a prefix, which is actually in a, in a prefix in AS33. However, this attacker at, three, at 666 is sending also an announcement for the same prefix. AS11 cannot know that this is actually a fake announcement, so he's going to send his traffic to the, the attacker, okay? So we see here a very simple way uh, for actually getting traffic you're not supposed to get. And notice that, this, the, that the reason that AS11 preferred A66 is because A66 is a customer. So the relationship is telling AS11, I prefer to send to my customer, right? Okay. Um, that's also, also, well, if you have a provider, it doesn't change anything. And then let's see another example. <coughs> Well, here the hijacking is not because of the relationship where the two, the relationship is the same between 66 and 22, but the path will be longer. So here's 333 announcing this prefix. It's fine. It's going to 22. It's going now to AS1. Everybody is happy. But now the, the attacker comes and he's announcing the same prefix incorrectly as if it belongs to him and it reaches. AS1, which of them is better? AS1 will prefer the attack one because the path is short. Okay, so that's what ends up happening. Okay. Uh, in, in general, if we just randomly place the attacker on the victim, so in this case, the victim, I mean to the, the real origin is 333, then they have kind of equally likely, if they, we place them randomly, they're, they're equally likely to win in this kind of competition. Of course, that holds if the prefix is announced. If there, there is no legitimate announcement of the prefix, then there is no competition, right? The best, the easiest way to win in a competition is if you are the only contender, right? If you're, if I will be the only runner in the Olympics, even I will win, and that will be amazing. Okay, so luckily in the Olympics they don't even let me compete. Okay, so. A very common scenario is when the attacker is announcing a prefix that nobody else announces. So sure, he will win. And that is actually this kind of um, silly scenario is actually very common because if you announce this, why would you announce a prefix nobody uses? Because then you can use it. And you become like, a, like everybody who has got it in a legitimate way because you can use it completely. You, you will receive packets, you can send packets with this packet, everything will work fine. And then you can use it for stuff like spam, sending spam, sending phishing emails, sending denial of service packets, which if you do this, after some time people detect, oh, there, there is this abuse coming from this internet address, and then they block it, they blacklist it, and people will not communicate with it, but you already moved to a different IP address. So that's actually a very useful, technique for spammers and different kind of attackers, spammer features, denial of service and more. Okay, DNS poisoning and more. Um, okay, now notice that we could, the same situation happens if you announce a sub prefix, okay? So here we have a situation where you're announcing, actually, I guess it's not a very good example because AS, in this example, AS1 will prefer the announcement from, AS, from the attacker anyway because of the relationship, Yes, but even if I wouldn't have done this mistake and I would have reversed the roles and let AS33 be, let's say, even a customer and AS66 be a provider, then still you will prefer the route through the, the uh, AS66. Why? 
Well, that's actually not the fault of BGP exactly. That is the fault of IP. Why? Because you notice this slash 10 and slash 16. Now, I didn't talk about this, but these are the lengths of the prefix of the number of bits in the IP address, which are, uh, represent the network address. So the more bits you have, it means that the network address is, has more bits and the, there are less bits for the, other, the rest of the bits in the IP address, which are used for the specific computer. So it's a smaller network. The longer prefix, the smaller network the more specific network, more precise network. So slash 16 is more specific than slash 20, slash 10, obviously. And uh, therefore, the IP protocol, again, not BGP, will seem, will always route to the more specific in case you maybe we had this large prefix, but somebody, some small prefix moved to a different place. So we prefer that. And the reason in BGP is that the attackers announcement success is simply because there is no competition. Nobody else is publishing, announcing this prefix at 9100016. So it is no competition in BGP world and in the IP world, it's more specific, so we prefer it. And I apologize for this example, I uh, should fix it. We'll fix it after the presentation if I remember. Okay, so th this, Attacks, as I mentioned, happen all the time. These are just few, few examples of these attacks. Uh, and this is just one I added a few uh, weeks, months ago. Uh, they happen all the time. They're simply, oh, 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 I think I've done a mistake. Uh, oops. Can you guys see it? Yeah? Yep, we can see it. Looks good. Okay, we'll be right. Okay. Okay, that was the bad one. Okay, so now let's talk quickly about the solution, our, uh, <clears throat> which is ROV and RPKI. ROV. ROV is a simple solution <clears throat> in principle. <clears throat> route stands for route origin validation, and this is essentially to prevent these prefix and sub prefix hijacking attacks. So we see here again, we have these two announcements, and we know, yes, the attacker is going to win because he's, in this case, because his pass is, AS pass is shorter, so he's going to win. But, <clears throat> no, it does not happen because route origin validation identified this is a, a spoofed and incorrect announcement, so he throws it away. So now we are fine. Okay, so only question is, how does it work? How do we get to throw this, right? And uh, there are different ways of actually validating the route origin. One way is to do it <coughs> to do it manually. So we just keep a list of the valid authorized origin assets for each prefix. That could be done, but of course it's very you know, labor intensive, a lot of mistakes and so on. We can do an online check against different databases and there are different databases which are keeping who is the origin of who, which prefix. Um, most well known are the internet routing registries, Unfortunately, these are also quite unreliable and checking online is also problematic, right? You get an announcement, now you begin to check online. <clears throat> so there is now a standard called RPKI, <clears throat> uh, whose goal is to offer offline reliable, digitally signed authorizations, we call them route origin <clears throat> authorizations. <clears throat> Uh, so let me explain what it is. RPKI stands for Resource Public Key Infrastructure. So it's a kind of a special PKI defined in RFC 6480. And in this standard, every owner <coughs> of a resource, and a resource is an AS number, but more importantly, a prefix, is getting a resource certificate. And the resource certificate shows that you actually own that uh, prefix. And they are signed in an hierarchical way, but uh, we can, I guess, skip this part. And then when you are the owner of a prefix, when you got this resource certificate for a prefix, you can sign a route origin authorization, which is not actually a certificate. It's, it's like an attribute certificate, if you like. It's just a statement saying, okay, I'm signing this. I'm the owner. He's a, this is a signature by the owner. This is, and I'm signing that this prefix can be announced by this origin. So notice the ownership and the origin do not have to be the same AS. 
the owner actually does not necessarily need to be an AS per se, is just the owner, although practically it's always an AS. And the, the AS must be the origin. The AS, so the, the owner can say, okay, this AS or maybe multiple ASs can announce its origin, okay, by issuing one or more ROAS. So here's the, this one. You see, I put a small padlock here to say it's signed. I will not discuss the details of the signing or even how these resource certificates are getting distributed. Uh, these are less important for, for us now. There is a pretty reasonable process for that. And the, the main point is that only the, the signed origin, if you have this raw, it means that only the signed origin may announce this prefix. And it also means that any announcement of a sub-prefix also requires a valid raw. So if you announce this, this raw, if, if you distribute this sign and distribute this raw, and I receive it, I will know that, okay, first of all, I'm, go I'm going to allow this origin to, you know, to oh, this AS could be an origin in any announcement I receive for this prefix, that's okay. And also, if I receive any announcement for this prefix or for any sub-prefix, mu I must also have a raw, which will justify that other announcement with, with a different origin, okay? That's very important. So we, as I said, we ignore the signing certification details, just assume signing means no forgeries, okay? And okay, so we receive this uh, ROA, okay? And ignore the, the signing details. We also ignore an, a very an important or problematic option called max length. I'll just mention one very useful convention. If we put here AS0, it means there is no origin because AS0 is not a legitimate AS number. And that is something that's very useful. I don't know if I get, have time to get into this, but something is very useful. In any case, these ROAs in, uh, facilitate the route origin validation by the BGP routers. That is, if we, if we get this ROA, we know, oh, we can drop BGP announcement of prefixes within 1, 2, 16, and anything within it, any sub-prefix, if the A origin AS is not this 333, unless we got some other valid row, of course, that would allow it, okay? So this would prevent prefix and sub-prefix hijacking, false origin domain. Let's see how it's done. So we have the same kind of simple attack we had before, but, oh, we don't have the row, right? Excuse me, we have the row now. So AS1 can say, aha, this fake announcement does not conform with the row. I don't have any other row that we justified. It is within the other space, within the prefix announced by the row, so I'm dropping it. Okay, so now we're using the correct route. Everything is okay. Okay, wonderful. What about deployment? Uh, so there are, deplo there are serious challenges in deployment of this standard, unfortunately. And one of them, one of the important problems is resulting from this kind of, kind of false positive, false conflicts, situations where we are dropping, we may be dropping an announcement because of a conflict with the world, just like we discussed right now, but it's actually a reasonable, a legitimate announcement, okay? And here is a, re a, re a real example. So we have, <laughs> RIPE is the European uh, internet uh, organization, organization, essentially, and is authorizing different uh, prefixes to different European ISPs, in particular Orange or French Telecom, which have this large prefix 194.2.0015. Okay, now, and they have announced the raw. Here's the raw that they have announced. They announced this is our prefix, and we are this is our AS number. Only we can announce these these prefix. But they also have some customers, and many of these customers have their own ASs and their own prefixes, like the none, for instance, here, which have a sub prefix. 194.235.24 for a different AS number. Now, unfortunately, while Orange have announced the large prefix, and the, the non has a sub prefix, but they did, did not issue a ROA. So this ROA will conflict with the uh, non BGP announcement, although the non are not you know, hijacking their own IP addresses but they look like as if they are. So 
if I am deploying ROV, I may be dropping the announcement and not eating yogurt, which is very bad. So uh, what can we do? Well, one approach is to say, oh, and should wait. They shouldn't issue raw until all of their customers issued raw for their sub prefixes, which is problematic, of course, and in particular, Orange don't agree with this logic. They say this is a problem for our customers. They should issue raw, not our problem. So the basic problem of adoption of RPKI and ROV is that this is a standard is requiring, first of all, a both authorizations, the resource certificates and the was and the validations are office. And we have this risk of potentially many false conflicts between an announcement and the war. And that is, again, because of the basic change that if we issue a raw for a prefix, it changes from a default allow, anybody can announce this prefix and sub prefixes to a default deny. If we don't have a raw for the, that the, uh, uh, prefix then any BGP announcement is okay and ROV validation will return unknown we, we don't we cannot validate it but if we have a ROV prefix we can uh, we only allow announcements which are allowed by the ROV and ROV will return either valid or invalid and for the none it will return invalid okay now a tricky point here is that this kind of conflict will not be noticeable at all like the nonna is not aware of this being a problem until when until people begin to really widely deploy ROV. So these kind of problems could persist for a long time. And then we could have, end up having problems if we adopt ROV. So brings us to question how common are these conflicts, right? And let's look at the graph. Here is a graph showing us in the yellow line we see all the announcements, the BGP announcements, which are not found, which don't have a role. So you see, they increase. There are more and more announcements on the internet all the time, and unfortunately, the number of announcements which don't have a role actually in increases. But we are interested in the announcements with a role. So these are the two other lines, the green line and the red line. And you see, they also in progress. They also you know, grow over time, increase. However, the problematic red line is also increasing. And we still have a pretty significant percentage of invalid wars currently on the internet. So this is the problem. It's not going down, at least not quickly enough, like we wanted. So there is this improvement, as you see, in the recent uh, period, there's a, the, the number of invalid or conflicting wars is slightly decreasing, but still there is a lot of conflicts and it may be too slow. And standards like this have a problem if they don't kind of solve the problems. And basically what we see from this red line is that dropping invalid BGP announcement may cause loss of traffic. So this brings us to the question, how many ISPs actually do deploy this ROV, actually drop invalid prefixes? And that is not so trivial to actually to know how many do this. So we've been doing quite a lot of work of measuring the number of ASs which are doing this. We have, we have actually deployed three different methods to do it. I'll, not, I'll skip the, to the bottom line. The bottom line is very disappointing. Only a very, very small number is, uh, of ASs is actually protected. There have been some improvement recently, mainly by uh, uh, AT&T has, has begun to doing some partial adoption, but still it's very, very limited. Why? Because of, of this uh, uh, problem of, uh, of loss of connectivity, transit ASs are paid for the traffic and for the connectivity. If we adopt ROV, we may get more traffic, more customers because we have security now, but we are very likely to get less traffic because we are dropping announcements. And if we drop announcements, we may also lose customers because they want connectivity. Uh, surely, if we drop legitimate announcements, people may Need, say, oh, we need a different provider. And so we understand that adoption of ROV is slow and uh, probably because of this problem will remain very slow, so, which brings to the question, does it help? Does this kind of partial deployment of ROV, does it help? Is it still significant help? So we still get value of this. And uh, later? 
yeah, 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 who, who will do? Sorry. Um, okay, so let's see about, we've uh, uh, done simulations to see what kind of security do we get against this prefix hijacking with only partial adoption of ROV. And we see, what, this is just one graph from this study, where we show the probability of adoption by different ASs going from zero to one, where, where we accept that 100 top ASs, and the 100 top ASs are adopting with probability either in the top line current probability, and in the yeah, green line, all of the top ASs are adopting. So you see, if all of the top ASs are adopting, actually that's enough to stop many, many of the attacks. But if uh, the top ASs are adopting as they are doing today, then even if everybody else is adopting, we still have a very large uh, success rate for sub-prefix hijacking. Okay, so this is, we conclude that, that adoption by the top, top ASs is necessary and sufficient for su substantial security benefits from RPKI ROV. Now, why? Why is this so ineffective with partial adoption? The basic reason is what we call collateral damage. So we see here uh, four ASs, one, and some, which is announcing a prefix, 66, which is announcing a sub-prefix of that prefix, two, which is a regular AS not adopting, and three, which is adopting. So you would expect if three is adopting, his traffic is protected. But let's see what really happens. So both of them are sending announcement. This is the, the AS1 is sending the legitimate announcement, and AS2 is then forwarding it to AS3, and also AS2 is sending the sub-announcement uh, going for the, the, for the sub-prefix 111 slash 24 to the attacker. Now, since domain three is enforcing ROV, it knows to drop the incorrect announcement. This incorrect announcement, it knows to drop it, but it, then it sends the traffic to AS2 in order for hoping for it to be forwarded to AS1. But the traffic to the sub-prefix AS2 is not adopting, so it will actually, according to regular IP, a mechanism it will forward the traffic to the attacker because it's a sub prefix. Okay, so we the traffic is still hijacked although AS3 is adopting ROV. It did not help us. So this is collateral damage. AS2 is not adopting, and as a result of it, traffic of AS3, which is adopting, is still hijacked. Okay. What are we trying to do in this space to improve it? Uh, first of all, with others in the community, we are trying to help in education, uh, peer pressure on ASS uh, publicity and so on. I guess this presentation is part of that. And then we are doing some more technical work. First, we have uh, this big ROV forecast project, uh, which should be pretty soon available in this URL. You can already access it and, and send us your email address for updates. And uh, this uh, allows you to estimate the impact of deploying ROV by any AS on the internet. So you can, and we're doing it by extrapolation of the internet-wide BGP pass from a lot of uh, BGP collector data from KDA and others, and measuring the accuracy of the, of the ROV adoption against real hi BGP hijacking, and comparing, we allow you to compare different ROV variants and policies, so you can see, oh, well, maybe if I adopt ROV with that policy, maybe it will actually provide me with value in my AS, or I should tell my provider to do it because see, it will actually help him. At least with this policy, they will not lose much and uh, they, it will actually pro protect against many attacks. That is, uh, we, we believe this may help to, uh, for people to decide to try to adopt and, and to install the software, which is after all, some investment of effort even uh, and not to mention, if you actually deploy it, then you can uh, have your traffic lost. So that's an, but even just installing is, you know, is, is some, some uh, overhead. And then we also work on our variants, whose goal is, first of all, to avoid these false positives, uh, to automate the whitelisting, to avoid dropping announcements which have been long lead, for instance. So we say, okay, they are not likely to be hijacked because most hijacks are you know, pretty short lived. So that's one kind of heuristic we may deploy, and there are some others. And we also work on a bigger variant, which is we call ROV++, which is, will be essentially avoiding this kind of collaborative damage. That's actually a very exciting 
extension of ROV uh, that we are working on. And we also, uh, another extension of ROV that we uh, proposed in uh, CICOM, uh, 2016 is what we call path end, path end extension, which will prevent, with a minor, minor extension of, of current RPKI, will prevent origin hijacking. Okay, so these are things we are working on. And we are working on experimental deployment with Yukon, our university, and with CN, the Connecticut Educational Network, or the ISP providing service to Yukon uh, of deployment of ROVs, ROAS, as well as uh, defenses against denial of service, which are related to routing, which will be our next topic. Okay, so we don't have much time. Time, I'll, actually, I don't know if we have time. Jeanette, should I continue or should uh, I stop? I don't know. Um, we've got 17 minutes and, and we can run over a little bit if you want to uh, kind of complete your, your okay, thoughts. So I'll, do it. I'll do the, de the denial of service part quickly. I just, just very, very briefly discuss some of this uh, protection and denial of service. This file is essentially explaining this very very basic common type of denial of service attack, which is by amplification denial of service attack. Uh, specifically, this example is about DNS. There are many, many DNS open resolvers, which are DNS servers, which are allow everybody to ask them and they provide responses for, for DNS requests from any, for any domain which you ask them about. Some of them are very large in the, the bandwidth, like OpenDNS and Google Public DNS, and these are usually pretty well protected. But there are millions which are not protected at all, like in home routers or IS, small ISPs, which, don't, which leave, left them open without noticing even. And all of these open resolve allows an attacker to control the response because he will make a request to his own domain, and then he sends a, a long response. But the request is using a spoofed source IP address of victim so the response actually goes to the victim and not to the attacker uh, okay so the response and since the response is cached then additional requests for the same resource will simply be sent to the victim without bothering the attacker so the attacker does not need to send all that much information he's only sending the information once but the victim is going to get a lot of these responses the responses are long the requests are short therefore we are using a relatively small amount of traffic, we are causing a lot of traffic and congestion to the victim. Okay, so that's a very, very large known problem. Uh, and uh, uh, we get the uh, victim gets congested, like, we sh like I show here in, a, in another example of the same attack, okay? And one solution which we are, uh, in the networking community is trying to use against this kind of bandwidth denial of service attacks or specifically a text using a spoofed IP address is called URPF, which stands for Unicast Reverse Path Filtering, a complex name for a simple idea, which is you drop an incoming packet. If you get an incoming packet, like here is 44, you drop the in pack incoming packet if it, you see that the sender IP address is actually spoofed or seems to be spoofed. When now, how do you know it's proved? Well, one, there are different kind of variants of URPF. Strict means you, there is a, you don't you receive it from some, from some path, which is not the path to the source. So you know, I'm sending to the source, I received from the source some IP address. So I'm sending, this is the address I'm using to the source. So I expect to also get message from the source in the same, from the same interface. Probably that's not always true. So we have also feasible uh, URPF, which is, I don't have any path from the source to that interface. So even if I use a different interface to that source, I will, okay, I still have a path to that source from the interface. So maybe for some reason, the source decided to get to me in a different way. And so it's even lose. I only drop if there is no path to the source, which is, so, which is rarely helpful against this sort of, of denial of, uh, against this sort of spoofing attacks because attackers have enough addresses which do have a path. So the question is, why don't we always use a straight one? Well, because we could have false positive. We could have traffic which we lose because we are doing this uh, strict. We are seeing the traffic from somebody which is not the path we have to send to the source, but it's still a legitimate packet. Uh, because 
uh, routing in the internet is not always symmetric. And, uh, but even if we do adopt strict, and definitely if we adopt feasible, the attacker may be able to foil our defense by doing prefix hijacking. He will be announcing this prefix. RPK can help us, first of all, to prevent this prefix hijacking. Secondly, it may help us to prevent these false positives, okay? So I'm not going to, to go into how uh, it, we can use RPKI to prevent the false positives. That requires some extension of the URPF mechanism, but that is another direction we are working on, an extension of URPF that will deploy RPKI also for the second goal of preventing false positives. So to sum up, in the routing is vulnerable in attack, both for misrouting, for intercepting, spam phishing, denial of service, and for spoofing which is mainly used for amplification denial of service attacks. RPKIOV may help against the misrouting and spoofing and also against amplification denial of service. Extension to RPKI may help uh, to improve its security and to also help in deployment easier. Deployment is a huge challenge for any security standard, but we believe in the case of RPKIOV, especially with this extension, it will become, it will be feasible. And I encourage you to uh, try our S uh, monitor of, for, for all this uh, secure interdomain routing and uh, some other resources in this uh, website. The monitor is uh, not yet really active. We are just kind of turning it in, but it should be active very soon. You can already put your email address there and we'll update you as uh, things get uh, deployed. Okay, that's it, thank you. Great. Um, so uh, we've got one question here. I'll, I'll uh, allow people to some time to uh, type their questions in, but uh, we've got one in here so far. Um, a couple of slides ago, uh, we got a comment here. You might consider speaking to the challenge of using ARIN's TAL due to their agreement requirements. Yeah, so there are some problems for people in, in okay, if, let me explain first of all, is is the, uh, the internet networking coordinator for North America. So the, the, uh, the globe has been split into several kind of coordinating bodies. One of them is RIPE or uh, RIPE NCC, as I see somebody has made it, that's uh, quite common, this sense for, Network, uh, network, okay, I forgot, coordination center, I think. Um, so, um, and Erin is, is the uh, North American one, and they are a bit concerned about issuing the these uh, uh, route, route certificates. And if you don't have a route certificates from your uh, regional coordinator, then you cannot issue your own uh, ROAS and, your, and, or, and of course also not route certificates to you, any, any of your customers which got a sub-prefix from you. So this is indeed a problem which, uh, because the requirements in the contract are problematic for many internet providers uh, to get these routing certificates, they are concerned about uh, who is, I guess, responsible in the case that this kind of was will cause loss of traffic when we just discussed how loss of traffic could actually happen if somebody is issuing your raw and the customer or sub prefix is not issuing your raw so that concern is is legitimate concern uh, and uh, this does happen but uh, I'm not sure that the right way to, to have such a concern is kind of a legal way uh, to just prevent it so yeah, this is one of the problems that is uh, causing, it, making it harder for people in North America, for network providers or, or, or prefix owner in North America to issue ZORs. Uh, we have a reply here. Actually, the validator software doesn't include ARIN's TAL because of the terms of service required. The, uh, again? Uh, so the, there was a reply to, to what you were saying, and the comment was actually the validator software doesn't include ARIN's TAL because the terms of service required. Oh, 
the right validator, you mean? Uh, okay, I don't know who I'm not talking with that person. So, uh, okay. Uh, uh, we could, uh, we could uh, have this person contact you if, there's, if they have further questions. Yeah, I guess, I think that's actually more of a comment than a question, but sure, I'd be welcome that person to, to contact me to have a discussion because it's a, a bit of a specific discussion, right? Mm -hmm. So he is, I think, a very legitimate concern. I can I, I definitely agree with that, yes. But uh, let me just add, kind of answer that specific issue that since uh, we and others are downloading and, and we have our own validator, uh, our validator will also be doing these more advanced policies that I mentioned, then there's no technical difficulty to add any anchors that you, any trust anchors that you like, right? So that by itself is not a problem for, uh, a, if a particular validator does not have it for legal reason, technically that does not prevent anybody else from adding a, another trust anchor. It's not a technical problem, it's a more of a, Legal for me. So let's uh, let's move on to a couple of things that I'd like to talk about with the Trusted CI's webinars, and uh, we'll let people type in questions if they have them. Uh, first, uh, please take our survey. I posted a link to the survey here in the chat, uh, so that uh, you could uh, give us some feedback about the webinar, the topic, or suggested topics for future presentations. I also included. Uh, Amir's link that he had at the end of his presentation in the chat. So you can grab that. And I will uh, be putting it in the email when I send out the link to the video and the slides. Um, in addition, we've got some other stuff going on. Um, Trusted CI has its first uh, cybersecurity technology transition to practice workshop uh, this June in Chicago, June 19th. For more information or to request an invitation, you can go to our page at trustedci.org slash TTP. Also, we will be at PERC. So those of you who are going to PERC, come find us. Uh, we will have a vendor table in the uh, exhibit area. And we're also uh, presenting a workshop and a panel. Um, I'm, I'm going to be blogging about that pretty soon to let people know about the uh, different activities that we will be involved with at PERC. Also, save the date. Our cybersecurity summit is coming in um, October, uh, October 15th through 17th in San Diego. To find out more information about the summit, you could go to trustedci.org slash summit. And next month, uh, a little bit more about our webinar series. To view presentations, uh, join our mailing list, or submit requests, you can visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. And our next webinar next month is on June 24th. At 11, the topic is the Trusted CI Framework, um, the architecture and, and architecture for cybersecurity programs. And this is going to be presented by members of Trusted CI. So if any of you are familiar with our team, Craig Jackson, Kay Avila, and Bob Cowles will be presenting. Um, so here, uh, we just have a, just a follow-up comment from the uh, earlier questions. Uh, the, the entire ARIN region is behind in its deployment of our PKI for reasons mm -hmm. you can view here and the person included a link. Um, and this is one of the most pressing policy issues for ARIN and it's effective uh, preventing ARIN customers routes from being protected via our PKI. Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I'll take a last, last call for questions or, or comments for Amir. Um, I, and uh, while people are typing, I'll just say thank you very much, Amir, for your presentation. Um, I'll be posting the video uh, shortly once I get it uh, uploaded to YouTube. And uh, any other questions or comments? It looks like, uh, I think we're, we're done. So Amir, do you have any other uh, concluding statements you wanted to make? Okay, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Stephen for, for his comment. That's a very important comment. So thank you and uh, that's, uh, no, thank you very, everybody for participating. And if ever, anybody will want to communicate, we are open. We'll be happy to communicate over these topics.
Thank you. Great. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing. Uh, everybody, thank you very much for attending the webinar. Once I uh, end the meeting, you'll be kicked out. So I just wanted to thank you now for attending and I uh, hope you guys have a great day. Oh, great. We've got some responses saying thank you. Well, thank you guys. Uh, Amir, thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you sometime. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.